Hans Boy Sorensen was born on a cold winter day, January 22, 1922, in Orderville, Utah. He was born while his father, Benny Hans, was away from home hauling freight to Marysville, Utah, to help make ends meet that winter. Benny's sister, Valet Esplan, was with Harriet Bauer Sorensen when he was born, and she chose the name Hans Boy. Voy, as he would be called throughout his life, loved his growing up years in the Orderville area, especially time spent on the family ranch. The wealth of stories Dad holds dear attest to a delightful childhood. Grandma always kept a coop full of bandy chickens to provide eggs for the family. Dad has said that the chickens were so used to the spring trek to the ranch that they would lift one leg so Grandma could boost them into the wagon. He speaks of her lovingly and says she was the best mother a boy could have had. He tells of her grappling for new potatoes in the summer to feed a family of growing kids. Dad has always had a fun-loving spirit, and he can see humor in the most difficult of situations. He tells of teasing little brother Hugh by hanging him on a nail by his suspenders when the older boys didn't want him tagging along. A story he loves to tell is of seeing a mother duck forming a neat little line with her ducklings to take them to the pond for a swim. Then he would put a broom handle right in her path so the mother duck and then each little duck in turn would trip and fall over it. It is reported to have been a very funny thing to watch. He remembers the Christmas that could have been a very sad one for the Sorensen family. Money was very scarce, and Grandma kept going to the window to see if Grandpa was coming from the ranch. It was getting late on Christmas Eve, and when Dad saw his mother cry for the first time, he knew things were serious. After a while, when Grandpa still hadn't come, Grandma sent him across the street to the post office with a note to Frederick Hoyt who in turn gave him $3 on a bill that he owed. Anxious to help, Dad hurried home with the money, and Grandma left the house and went to Croft's store where she bought Christmas. Grandpa came in late that night while Grandma was making candy and popcorn. The next morning, they had one of the best Christmases Dad can remember, with candy and presents for everyone, all on a lot of love and $3. Dad claims to have been very shy when he was young, and he would hide when a big group of people were at the house. One Halloween, Grandpa took Dad with him to a costume ball. A friend had won a big sack of candy, and the men were all laughing and talking together and didn't notice him. But Dad didn't forget him and kept slipping him pieces of candy. In his own words, Dad said, that's just the kind of dad he was. On a Halloween at the ranch when Dad was small, A hired hand helped him carve a jack-o'-lantern and then talked all day about how much fun it was going to be to take it up and scare Uncle Dave. Dad was really excited about it until darkness fell and he said all the trees started to look like monsters. The thought of going out made his hair stand on end. He decided that scaring Uncle Dave just wouldn't be worth the trip. From a horse named Old Susie, Dad learned that if there's a will, there's a way. When we first got old Susie, I was too little to get on, so I would lead her out to the field. As she loved, she loved to eat, so when she started eating, I would put my leg behind her ears, then kick her nose. When she raised her head, I would slide down into place. By age five, Dad was driving a team of horses and keeping watch over the sheep to be sure they stayed in the field. It amazes him to see how little responsibility five-year-old kids have today compared to what he did at that age. On a bitter cold night, he and Uncle Rouse, his mother's older brother, were taking two wagons loaded with baled hay to town. As they came to Muddy Creek, Uncle Rouse told Dad to wait and let him go first, then he would walk back and help him across. The creek was frozen over, and as the wagon was bumped down onto the ice, Dad lost his balance and fell. Uncle Rouse caught him by the foot but couldn't hold him, and he bumped his head on the wheel. Dad didn't realize he was hurt until he got home, and his mother was washing out the cut. He said the sight of blood in the dishpan made either him or Aunt Dot faint. He couldn't remember which. He still carries that scar in the part of his hair. He and Earl Sarnson have always been good buddies, and one summer day, when the blue plums were ripe, 
Earl asked him if he would like to take a bucket full home to his mother. Dad said that after that, Grandma always thought he loved blue plum jam. He never could convince her otherwise. Dad and Aunt Dot have enjoyed some good times, and she's always been there to help in any way she could. One summer at the ranch, when the garden was coming right along, the squirrels started coming up out of the wash to have a taste. Grandpa had some big coyote traps, and Dad decided to catch the squirrels. He was too little to set them alone, so he recruited Aunt Dot to help him. They set a couple of the traps, but the last one was really tough. So she stood on it while he set it. She lost her balance and fell over backwards. She put a hand in each of the traps they had so carefully set. I said, oh my gosh, was she hurt? And Dad grinned and said, not permanently. Pine gum from a good pine tree has been a family treat for as long as I can remember. And when Dad was a little boy, he would find some and then run to the field where his dad was plowing and get him to start him a chew. It was always so nice to have his mother come to the ranch after batching it for a while with his dad. Grandpa would make biscuits, claiming that he was the only person he knew who could make 100 pounds of bread out of 50 pounds of flour. Dad remembers Mont. It was always fun to be with Mont. There was one thing he didn't ever learn, and that was how to be afraid. Fear was one thing he didn't know anything about. He shot both barrels of a double-barreled shotgun one day, and it knocked him flat on his back. We had a swing on a hay crane, and one day he was on the long end, and we were pulling him around on the short end. He was holding on to a stick when he, Jorgensen, come by on a horse, and we handed him the rope. Mont was swinging higher than the barn, and when the stick broke, he went sailing clear down to the lower end of the stackyard. He plowed down a rick of corn, and we went running down to see how dead he was, and he was just rolling around, rubbing his hind end. Dad remembers the building of the road into Zion National Park. He says the builders used teams and wagons to haul gravel. Since the horses had to have feed and the Sorensen boys took a load of hay to the building site one day, the lady from the cook shack came over and said, Good Lord, kid, let me look at you. She was referring to his eyes that are different colors. Then she took him to the cook shack and cut him a fourth of a piece of raisin pie. That was a first for him and he felt very important. He has always been self-conscious of his eyes, but those who know him think it only adds to his charm. Hey, when they were doing the tunnel mm-hmm. between Zion the big Park. Ta- yeah. Zion Park, and he said he took a load of hay down with his dad one day, and he said the, he was just a little kid, and he sat up on the, they got there and they went in, apparently had a cook shack, went in and the lady looked at him and said, Good Lord, kid, you've got two colored eyes. You deserve another piece of pie. (laughs) So it was always kind of a, said the first thing he did when we were born is said, were their eyes the same same color? color. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't that what your mom said? That's that's how she knew she was going to marry him? Maybe so. You hear all kinds of things. Stories like that? She, the day she met him. She, she knew he was the one. And he was engaged to another woman. I remember that, yeah. yeah. I don't remember that. I remember hearing the story of it, yeah. Her name was Verla Brinkerhoff. <laughs> oh, yeah. And she was a wonderful girl. And I think it was the hardest thing Dad ever did to... Break that engagement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think he ever did. No? From the day, till the day he died, he said, I need to write a letter to Verla. <laughs> <laughs> She heard it through the grapevine. Oh, okay. And I think that was hard for him. Horses were a part of everyday life at the ranch. Aunt Clara really liked to ride the workhorse named Queen because she loped so fast. It's obvious that Aunt Clara was a very special to Mom and Dad as they named their second child a daughter after her. Dad had some happy memories hunting deer with Uncle Burke, and Burke's children have been a source of pride and laughter in Dad's life. When Dallas and Lee were little boys, they were up to the ranch and were playing on the fence by the pig pen, which had a huge wallowing hole. 
Mont was close by bridling a horse when Dallas fell in. Mont jumped in after him and pulled him up by the suspenders. Aunt Beth was at the house on the front porch as Mont held up the dripping Dallas and hollered, What should I do with him? Aunt Beth looked over the situation and said, Oh, Landy, just throw him back. It would be easier to get another one than clean him up. Ray was always so thoughtful of Grandma, and he, according to Dad, was the white sheep of the family. He would go to the ranch in the spring and clean the house good before she moved in. He brushed her hair and helped around the house. As far as Dad knows, Ray never shot a gun and tried to teach Dad how to take care of his clothes. The Sorensen kids were always late starting school in the fall as they stayed and helped at the ranch until about October. Dad took grade school very seriously. He really wanted to be promoted and was always relieved when he was. But by high school, he had lightened up and thought it was just all for fun. He said that when you finally got that grown up, you got to slick your hair straight back so that you had to use a lot of water on it. In the winter, his hair would freeze solid by the time he got to school. One year, he had missed so much school that he lacked one credit to graduate. So they talked the principal into letting him take home ec. Sandy Jorgensen and Dad run the 440 relay race in track. Seven Johnson of Kanab made a habit of beating them. The last track meet of his senior year, he and Sandy were prepared. They knew if they could get one step ahead, they could win. Sandy got the first stride out of seven, and Dad kept it when it was his turn. They beat Seven Johnson. Dad said he can still see Sandy jumping up and down and cheering him on. Sandy passed away a couple of years ago, and Dad said it made him sad because he was the only one who held that memory as dear as he does. Dad played the trumpet in high school, but he said not good enough to mention here. Basketball held some real adventures. People didn't travel around like they do now, and ball trips were really a treat. The Dixie High School ball team hadn't lost a game that last year Dad played ball. They came up to play Valley just before going to state. The Valley boys beat them just barely before the Dixie team went on to take state. Uncle Ed Carroll gave Dad a pair of spurs when he was 16 and he used them well. He has always loved horses, going riding in the hills, roping cows, and helping Earl in Sinkville with his cattle. Dad served valiantly and bravely during World War II in the South Pacific, where he earned a purple heart and a bronze star. The saying, all give some and some give all, resonated with Dad. He was on a ship headed for Japan and knew it would take three waves of men to get one man on shore. And he was in the second wave when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and the war for him was over. Dad has mentioned that it was a great comfort to him to know that no matter how far he got from home, he was always in his mother's and family's prayers as they were a very important part of this family's day. He had many harrowing experiences as a soldier. October of 1944 found him in Bougainville, Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. At that time, his actions earned him a citation and a silver star. He also received a purple heart. He remembers a Thanksgiving spent in a foxhole and finding a can of sweetened condensed milk to which he and his buddies added a little chocolate. He said that that tasted better than anything he can remember unless it was a cold beer on a really hot day. Well, that was the day when he was wounded and the only available water was warm. He attained the rank of sergeant and has said many times that the one lesson he learned well was to stay on higher ground. You're never safe unless you stay above the enemy. Dad has talked often of the war years and the men he shared them with. He met Heber Staley in the Army, and they became close friends and comrades. They went through trials that bond men for life. 
mom, Farrell Staley, was born on January 30th, 1927. The fourth of 11 children born to Clarence and Beulah Staley. Mom had lots of responsibility growing up, helping with the household chores and the many bushels of fruit they bottled in the fall. She left home when she was only 15 to go to California to work to help support the family. She was back home in Enterprise working for B.J. Lund's store when she met the man of her dreams, the handsome, hands voice Sorensen. In a dream, Mom had seen a man with two different color of eyes and felt that if she ever met him, he would be the one for her. Well, it was Heap's friendship that brought Dad to Enterprise where my mom was working at Lund's, and that's where he first met her, and it was love at first sight. They were married in the St. George Temple May 15, 1946, when she was 19 and he was 24. They lived in Orderville for a short time where Dad worked on the family-owned ranch. Then they moved to Mom's hometown of Enterprise, Utah, where they bought a basement home from George and Nola Clove, and this dwelling was a ground-level addition built a few years later, and it would remain Dad's home for 45 years. And now Deanne, my sister, owns that home and has remodeled it, and so whenever I go home, I go home to all those beautiful memories we shared in that little home. Deanne Sorensen, my sister, was born June 15, 1947, on Father's Day. Dad adjusted to life in Enterprise and always had a good relationship with his in-laws, and really anybody that knew Dad, he had a good relationship with. To Dad, hard work has seemed to be a friend, and he, he was never afraid to try anything, and there was, has never been a time when his services were not in demand. One of the first jobs after going to Enterprise was to clear the Seth Jones property above town of cedar trees. He had only an axe, so a lot of elbows grease went into that job. He also worked in the turkeys and has told me how he loved to take little Deanne with him to feed them. He said that at first he was worried that they had pecker, but they never did. And he said he always could tell where she was because of her little white head, and there was always a flock of turkeys around, following her around. Well, I came along on July 10, 1949, completing our family, and two little girls could not have had a better dad. We have always told him that because of his love for us, it has never been hard for us to believe in a heavenly father, a loving father in heaven. There was a saying that the best gift a father can ever give his children is to love their mother, and he gave us that precious gift. Deanne and I had a wonderful childhood and the best parents ever, but we have always remained close and to this day are best friends and soulmates. Dad and Mom were always there for us. We remember listening to the fan on the furnace run on cold winter nights and feeling completely secure. Then in the mornings, we would look for the painting Jack Frost made on the window panes. We thought he was an amazing man. <laughs> Dad worked at the iron mine most of the time while we were growing up. And we really hated the graveyard shift because we had to be very quiet as Dad was sleeping during the daylight hours downstairs. There were times we'd sneak downstairs to try to pry Dad's eyes open to see if he was really asleep. And I bet he really appreciated that after working all night. I don't remember Dad ever getting angry at us unless he was helping us with our homework math. And I can remember how frustrated he'd get at us sometimes when we couldn't understand it. He always made us things like swings and whirly gigs and tether balls and playhouses. Always trying to make things for us that would make our lives wonderful. When we were little girls, we loved to go to Orgerville to visit Grandpa and Grandma, aunts, uncles, and cousins. The Sorensons are a fun-loving people, and we had some very good times singing to Mom's guitar listening to Grandpa sing the laughing song, playing his mandolin and joining in games like the one about what color you're on. He loved trips to the trash pile, and we always marveled that people threw away such good stuff. 
Dad had a way of making everything seem like an adventure, and as we headed home with our junk treasures, he would let us ride, straddling the headlights on the front fenders of our old black pickup. We would squeal with delight as he raced the motor, making us think we were really flying. One year we had a lot of snow, and Dad made a sleigh out of the hood of an old car turned upside down. He saddled his horse, old Nick, and tried tied a rope to the sleigh and pulled us and many neighborhood kids to school. He would get going really fast and spin us around. Needless to say, we loved it. Christmas was magical at our house. We always had the prettiest tree and the most beautiful lights. Mom spent days decorating the tree, getting every icicle hung just right. One year, Dad was working graveyard at Christmas time, and when he got home, in the morning, he told us he had seen old Santa the night before, had chased him, caught him, wrestled him down, and pulled his whiskers. We were really quite worried about this little episode as we didn't think he was winning us any brownie points. We were raised very strictly Mormon, with obedience to every rule, greatly stressed. Mom was a stickler on keeping your word, and when we said we would do something, we did it. We were taught the importance of the golden rule, and Mom and Dad held many jobs in the church and were great teachers. Mom was especially helpful in the music department. They were temple workers at the St. George Temple for many years. When I was 13 and Clara 11, after much searching, Mom left the church. Dad was second counselor in the bishopric at the time. It was a major shake-up, and it wasn't easy time for two little girls. But attaining spirituality remained the main focus in their lives. Although there have been lots of turns and twists, we have learned many things. In early August 1965, Mom became very ill and was bedridden for about three months. It was a very hard time for our family. Although Mom did pull through, her health was never the best after that. Dad was always there for her. The Iron Man closed in about 1963, and Dad had to decide whether to move to Lander, Wyoming, where the mine would continue to give him employment or stay in Enterprise and try to find work on his own. He decided on the latter and went to work building fences. He built many fences in this area and along I-15. He contracted hundreds of miles of fence project and has hired a lot of different help, but the most steady employees were Delmer Jones and Carrie Holt. I married Carrie in January 1965 and after Carrie's stint in the Army, Dad bid their toughest fencing job to help Carrie raise money to pay his farm payment and achieve his dream of farming. The project was building the fence and placing right-of-way markers along the freeway being built through the narrows of the Virgin River Gorge. They both lost 20 pounds that summer as they scaled cliffs in the heat, sometimes on ropes, and drove posts into solid rock. Dad has done a lot of cement work in his time, pouring many sidewalks, driveways, and basements. When Uncle Hugh bought the house moving business, Mom and Dad moved their trailer to Las Vegas and stayed a few months at a time to help. Dad enjoyed the work and loved the time spent with Uncle Hugh and Joyce and their family. In 1980, Carrie bought our first hay cuber, and Dad went to work there. He was great help in getting that operation off the ground, taking interest in every aspect of the farm. He was there to help with any job, great or small, to improve overall productivity. He was very proud and happy to see the operation become a success and a profitable business. Clara married Chess Lumpkins, March 6, 1970. They met while working at Grand Canyon. They divorced in 2000. Clara married the man of her dreams, Wes Hansen, in 2004. She is living happily ever after in Murray, Utah. Dad has two grandsons, Voylan Holt, born June 1, 1968, and Ryan Carey Holt, born September 10, 1974. He has taken great interest in their lives, and both he and Mom have loved them like their own. Dad has carried on the tradition of them, with them of building stealth houses, 
rabbit pens, tree houses, and swings. He could always find the very best red sand for sandboxes and has helped us out fix up many old houses until we were proud to call him home. In February of 1989, Mom suffered a stroke. It left her paralyzed on her right side and affected her speech. It was so hard on her and equally hard on Dad. He took constant care of her for three years. Clara was here at the time and stayed to help for about six weeks. She was here more than she was home for the next three years. It was hard for our family, but we learned things we might not have learned otherwise. Mom had true grit and an amazing will to live, but her struggle ended on December 18, 1991. We had taken her to a care center in St. George as Dad's health was so poor and he needed surgery. He was in the hospital at the time of her death. In September 5, 1992, Dad married Farrell Lamb, a childhood friend. They were married very quietly at a favorite spot on Cedar Mountain. If anyone deserved happiness, it was these two. They lived happily in Orderville for seven years until Dad passed away. So in a way, I guess Dad's life came full circle. Today I sat on a wooden crate in the warm April sun and watched as my dad took apart, board by board, a small wooden building. It had long collected things, items that in Dad's mind held a vision of use and benefit. He did a lot of resting in between pulling boards so we could have some time to visit. There was a small bucket nearby that he attempted to throw away long and used nails into, but he missed often and decided it was useless. His hair is gray and thinning, and a brisk north breeze blows a few longer strands awry when he takes off his hat to wipe away the sweat. His shoulders are stooped and his face slightly puffed from a medication he has to take. He doesn't move as fast as he once did, and he mentions how thankful he is to be up and around and able to do what needs to be done. What a beautiful day it is and how glad he is for the cool breeze. Then he pushes himself to pull another board, feeling it is important to complete his task. My mind takes me back 40 years to where as a little girl, I sat on a stack of boards in the hot July sun and watched as my dad carefully measured sawed and nailed one board at a time to make the small wooden building a playhouse for his girls. The boards were new then, and the smell of pine sawdust was heavy in the beating sun. The hot sand would burn my bare feet as I ran to help, but he was building us a dream house, and helping Dad is one of my favorite things. He was young then, handsomely tanned and muscular. He loved to work and found pleasure in about any job. He devoted much time to building things to delight my little sister and me. He was strong and healthy and laughed easily and often. His sense of humor remains intact. We loved that little house and spent many joyful hours playing house, tending kittens, cleaning, fixing chewy weeds for dinner, and dreaming. I tuck these memories away in my mind to recall whenever I choose. I'm really not sad as I watch the demolition of our little house. It served its purpose. Its time is past. I'm just happy for the time together and amazed at how fast time marches by. Much has happened in all our lives. We're all older. Mom is gone but lovingly remembered. So much has changed. I take comfort in the one thing that remains constant, untouched by time the love of a daughter for her dad, and the unconditional love he gives in return. In the end, what more could we ask? Dad loved horses and sunsets and cowboy ways. He was always a delight to be around and had such a fun sense of humor. And he found pleasure in the simple things. He loved pine picking, he loved camping, hauling a good load of wood to fuel his roaring fires during the winter months. He was a wonderful husband, the best father and grandpa. Mom, Farrell Staley, was a beautiful lady with a generous heart. 
If anyone left her home hungry, it was because they declined the simple food that she offered. Music came as second nature to Mom. She played the piano, accordion, guitar, and banjo all by ear. She gave free lessons to any young person in town who was interested in learning, and there were many. We remember many good times with our dear cousins as we'd gather in Grandpa and Grandma Sorensen's home in Orderville to sing to Mom's guitar and Grandpa's mandolin. When we reached teenage years, there was not a lot to do in our small town, so Mom and Dad agreed to sponsor and chaperone Friday night dances. They invested in a big tape recorder with speakers and a turntable that we re could record all the latest hits from different kids in town to be played at the dances. These dances went on for years, and Mom and Dad were always so glad to serve. As the years go by, we've come to appreciate Mom's constant presence in our home, the homemade bread and the good meals that magically appeared morning, noon, and night, a tidy, well-kept home, and clothes neatly pressed and ironed and put away. Things we took so for granted were such beautiful gifts. Mom was a devoted and loving, caring mother and grandmother, and her love grew and radiated through her eyes, even though she could not speak after her stroke. She passed away at the age of 64 on December 18, 1999, and her memory only becomes dear as time passes. Mom and Dad were prayerful people, and Dad would never leave for work in the morning, but what they would always wake us up for morning prayers before he left. We always kneeled around the kitchen table for evening prayers before we ate dinner. That was always a value they lived by. Mom and Dad stood side by side, hand in hand, through sickness and in health, Dad passed away June 17, 1999, at the age of 77. But his kind and gentle and loving ways will live forever in our hearts.